One day there was a gentleman who was standing by the Niagara River. It was winter time. He was one of those men who were intensely attracted by the wonders of nature. Suddenly, he saw an eagle swoop down upon a large chunk of ice as it was flowing down the Niagara River. As he looked a little bit closer, he noticed that encased in that ice, in that floating piece of ice, was a lamb that must have fallen down in the fall and frozen there all winter. As the eagle was standing there pecking on that lamb, every so often he would look up, realizing his danger, and look up further down, downstream where the falls were coming. He seemed to be saying, oh, I'm not a fool. I know what I'm doing. I will fly up and make my escape before it is too late. As the eagle came right up to the falls, he lifted up his powerful wings as he was about to leave. And as he began to spread his wings, he couldn't go anywhere. His talons were frozen to the fleece of the lamb. And as that chunk of ice together with a lamb went over Niagara Falls, you can hear the eagle shrieking until it was killed. That fate of that unfortunate eagle stands as a warning to every single one of us who consciously start on the wrong track, duping ourselves with a thought that we will stop doing evil before it is too late. And it reminds me of a Bible verse, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, this verse, verse was so very important that in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 25, we read, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. God thought it was important for us to repeat it, to remember that there are ways that we think are right, but the end thereof is the way of death, just like in the case of that eagle. Something's amazing about sin. Sin is first pleasing, then it grows easy, then delightful, then frequent, then habit habitual, then confirmed, then the man is impenitent, then he is obstinate, then he is resolved never to repent, and then he is ruined. On the other hand, the writer of Proverbs has another verse, a verse that has a much better end, rather than the ways of a man, the way, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is another verse in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18. Proverbs 4 verse 18 says, But the path of the just is as a shining light which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Well, how can a person who is so used to walking down in the path of death, how can that type of person turn around and walk in the path of light? How can a person who is getting ready to go down the Niagara Falls, that is feasting on that lamb as it's going down to the waterfall, how can that person turn around and escape? Well, let us take a look at some things of how Jesus answered that question. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus gave us the answer to this question of how we can turn around and be saved. It says here, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Isn't this wonderful? We will know the truth, and that truth is what is going to make us free. That truth will turn us around. Does this mean that we are in slavery? If we're going to be made free, does this mean we are slaves? Well, in verse 33, the Jews refused to think that they were slaves. It says in verse 33, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. 
How sayest thou, you shall be made free? How can you say you are going to be made free when we were never in slavery? We are the children of Abraham. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. It doesn't matter the day where Abraham said, If we commit sin, we are servants of sin. In other words, we are in the service of Satan, who is the father of sin, when we are not in the path that shineth more and more into the perfect day. You see, in verse 44 it says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father will ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. So in reality, when we are serving sin, it doesn't matter what we call ourselves. It doesn't matter what denomination we come from. It doesn't matter what kind of a heritage we have. We may have faithful Christians all down through our line. Maybe our parents, maybe our grandparents. But it says here that if we are committing sin, we are serving sin. And therefore we're not on the path that shineth more and more into the perfect day. We are in a path that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So then what is truth? What is truth when it says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is this truth that can make us free like that? What is that truth that we need to know? Well, Pilate asked the same question. In John chapter 18 and verse 38. John chapter 18 and verse 38. When Jesus was standing there before Pilate in the judgment hall, it says here, Pilate said unto him, What is truth? What a wonderful question. Pilate had an opportunity to know and hear for himself what is truth. And if he could have understood what the truth is, it says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It says, Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault in him. What a tragedy. Pilate asked the question, but he never sat down to listen to the answer. And this happens so often. We ask a question, but no answer is given. Well, what is the truth? Oh, if Pilate could have just stayed a little bit longer, if Pilate would have just listened a little bit to the answer of Jesus, Jesus would have given him the same answer that he gave just a little bit before in John chapter 14 and verse 6. John 14 and verse 6. Thomas asked him a question, and Jesus answered him. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So what does he say here? Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth. If Pilate would have just sat there a little bit longer, he would have known, he would have understood that Jesus is the truth. And isn't this wonderful? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In other words, you shall know Jesus, and Jesus will make you free. It is only through Jesus that we are able to turn around from our path of destruction, from the way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Jesus is the only one that can turn us around and take us into the path that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Oh, and what is the truth? How, what, how, what power is there in the truth? Let us look in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. What is it, gospel here? Jesus is the gospel. It is the good news. And it's the good news of Jesus coming to this world. Well, this gospel is the power of God and the salvation. He is able to change you. He is able to make you new in Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible presents in the simplest language the mighty power of the gospel which received would cut the chains that bind men to Satan's chariot.
Yes, we are tied down. We are chained down to Satan's chariot, taking us down to the road of destruction. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves, but Jesus is the only one. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus coming here to be able to cut those chains, chains and separate us from Satan and bring us to everlasting life. Now what does it mean to know the truth? It says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, what does it mean to know the truth? You know, the Sadducees had flattered themselves in the time of Jesus that they of all men adhered most strictly to the Scriptures. They thought, oh, we know the Word. We know what is written in the Bible. Oftentimes, they memorized large portions of Scriptures. But when Jesus came to them, what did He tell them? in Mark chapter 12 and verse 24. Mark chapter 12 and verse 24. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? Do you not make a mistake? You don't know the Scriptures. Could you imagine that? Knowing large portions of Scriptures, memorizing many passages, and someone coming to tell you, you don't know your Bible? Well, that's what Jesus said. He told these very same people, these doctors of divinity, these who memorize these scriptures, He says, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. What a tragedy. So even if we have great mental store of the glorious knowledge of the gospel, of the scriptures, it does not necessarily correspond to an equality of great power in being free from the slavery of sin. So how can we understand that verse then? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How can we understand that? Well, first of all, it's not a casual acquaintance with Jesus. In John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus told us how He's going to be able to draw people to Himself. John chapter 12 and verse 32. He says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So Jesus, when He is lifted up from the earth, He will draw all men unto Himself. Why then, after Jesus was lifted up from this earth, He was raised up there on the cross, why is it that everyone has not been drawn unto Him? Why is that? Well, because there's something a little bit more that is necessary. We need to understand what the meaning of that is. In John chapter 1, verse 29, you find that John the Baptist had the right idea. When Jesus came the next day, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb. Beholding does not mean just casually glancing it means to look. It means to contemplate. It means to study. It's important for us to behold Jesus. It's not enough just to say the name Jesus. It's not enough to claim ourselves to be Christians. We must behold the Lamb of God. We have an illustration of this in the Old Testament. In the time when the children of Israel, when they were going in the wilderness and they were complaining about the difficulties of the way that the Lord then withdrew His protection and suddenly they had all those venomous serpents in the wilderness coming there to bite them. We have this experience recorded in Numbers chapter 21 verses 6 through 9. Numbers chapter 21 verses 6 through 9. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld a serpent of brass, he lived. What happened here? 
it says that God, what did He do? He told Moses to make a serpent and put it on a pole. And when the people were bitten, they beheld that serpent on that pole. And as they beheld that serpent, they were made whole. That's right. Well, Jesus used this same illustration when he was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was trying to understand what does it mean to be born again. How can a man be born again? Well, Jesus tells us how we can be born again. Let's take a look in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what was going to happen here? It says very clearly that the way we can be born again is when, as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, whoever believes in Jesus, the uplifted Jesus, he will have eternal life. He will not perish. In Desire of Ages, that book I was quoting from again, let me read it again. It says, Let the repenting sinner fix his eyes upon the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And by beholding, he becomes changed. His fear is turned to joy, his doubts to hope. Gratitude springs up, the stony heart is broken. A tide of love sweeps into the soul. Christ is in him, a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Oh, what a wonderful thing. It, we need at this time to take the time to behold the Lamb of God so that we can have that eternal life. Now that serpent in the wilderness that was hanging there on that pole, that only represented something. It was as people beheld that serpent and in faith looked to the Redeemer that they were able to be healed. That serpent on that pole had no power. But you know what happens with people. As soon as you make something, they have a tendency to worship it. And in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, there was a problem among the Israelites. They began to worship that brazen serpent. And so in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4, when God had a man of God, a king that was faithful, it says here, what did he do? This was Hezekiah. It says he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. So here it says very clearly that they began to worship that brazen image as if that brazen serpent had the power. But there was no power in there. But Christ did not say that I, if I am lifted up, those who believe in what I represent will be freed from sin. No, he said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Why is it? Because Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, why is it that Jesus will draw all men unto Him? What is that drawing power that if we behold the Lamb of God, right now if you would take the time to behold Jesus, there will be a drawing power. You will have the conviction in your heart. Why is there power in Jesus to draw all men unto Himself? Is it because He was good and He was sinless? Well, we know that Jesus was sinless. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21 and 22. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow His steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. What about Jesus? It says here, He did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. Well, He was perfect. But do you think that perfection in a person draws sinners to themselves? Or is it the other way around? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12 says, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
So if a person lives a godly life, do you think people are drawn to that? More often than not, when sinners see a good person, they have a tendency to persecute that person. For that reason, in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, after telling Nicodemus the way that he can be born again, it says this way, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? It says, Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. It's amazing when you have mice and who knows whatever else in the, in the house. I remember when I was living in an apartment up in Laurel, Maryland, and during the night there in the kitchen, all these cockroaches came from these other rooms there, from the other buildings. They came inside and you switch the light on and suddenly you see all these bugs running for cover. And this is what happens. When the light is switched on, people tend to run away. So why is it then that Jesus has power to draw all men unto himself to be able to give them life? Well, let's first answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus that he has this power to draw all men unto himself? In John chapter 1, verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It says that this person called the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Obviously, this is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Word. Jesus was made flesh and He dwelt among us. Yes, but who is this Word? Who is this Jesus? Let's look at John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Notice these points. It says, first of all, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this Word that was God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who was it that dwelt among us? It was Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ, then it says here, He is the Word of God. He was with God. Jesus is God. It says further, all things were made by Him. How many things were made by Jesus? All things. So then Jesus is the Creator. He created everything. If Christ made all things, He existed before all things. So if He was the one that made everything, He had to exist before all those things were made. The words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need be left in dark doubt. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity, God over all, blessed forevermore. Yes, Jesus was God. Now since He was never created, but rather He created all things, He must be God. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, a prophecy about the coming Messiah. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What is his name going to be? Among the names that are listed here, we can call him the Mighty God. That's right. Jesus is the mighty God. Apostle Paul also describes Jesus as God in 1st Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1st Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy, there is no question about this, there is no controversy in this issue. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, 
preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. That's right. God was manifested in the flesh. That's right. It was God that was here. In Matthew, as it was describing Jesus, when he was coming to this world, he gave him a special name to show that he is God here in this world. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's right. Jesus, when he came to this world, he was fully God with us. Because he is God, can we worship him? Can we worship God? Is it appropriate to worship God? Well, let's take a look and see what God the Father said about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. What does He command all the angels to do? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. But unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. What does the Father say to the Son? He says, Thy throne, O God. You see that serpent in the wilderness that was there on that brazen serpent that was hanging up there on that pole. That serpent was not God, so you could never worship it. But Jesus, when He was lifted up from the earth, when He was placed on Calvary's cross, He was God, and it was appropriate to worship Him. Now keep in mind, when Jesus is God, we can worship Him. But is the cross God? Is that wood that was sitting there, is that God? No. It was Jesus on that cross that is God. And we are to worship not the cross. We are to worship Jesus on that cross. But now what happened to this Jesus? What happened to God, this God of the universe, this creator of heaven and earth, the one who created you, the one who gives you life, as we read in the last study there, that the Word has power, and that what was the Word doing? It upholdeth all things by the Word of His power. That Word is giving you life right now. Without that power of that Word, you have no life. But you do have life because the Word is giving you that life. But now, what did that Word, that Creator of the universe do? John chapter 1, verse 14, we just read it a little while ago. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's right. That Word, that God, that Creator of the universe, that One who existed before anything else was created because He created all things, that One came to this world and became flesh. Now, how can God become man? How is it possible for the Creator to become the created? How is that possible? Well, the Bible has a name for it. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Here it calls it, great is the mystery of godliness. And what is the mystery of godliness? God was manifested in the flesh. So the Bible calls this, this God becoming flesh, it calls it a mystery. It's something that we fully cannot comprehend. But we can at least, even though this mystery is something we cannot understand, yet we can know about it. John 3, verse 16, you know the verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's right. There is a God who so loved us that He gave Jesus here to this world. But now what does it mean that He became flesh? What does it mean that God became flesh and dwelt among us? You know, for Jesus to become like an angel would have been an infinitely great sacrifice for Him. That would have been a tremendous sacrifice. But it says here, let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. 
What happened to this Creator? Hebrews 2 verse 9 it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, for He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. In order to taste death for every man, what did Jesus have to do? He had to be made a little lower than the angels. Well, what does that mean? In the book of Psalms, chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, it tells something about you and me. It says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Isn't this amazing? We also were created a little lower than the angels. That means that Jesus became just like man when he came to this world. When Jesus was manifested in the flesh, he became just like us. Yes, eternal God, one who had life, one who was the creator of the universe. That creator came here and became one of us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 tells us a little bit more. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same. That's right, he took part of the same thing that you and I do. That through death he might destroy him that had power over death, that is, the devil. Jesus came into this world. He took part of the same flesh and blood. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 is even a little bit more specific. It says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So Jesus Christ came how? He came of the seed of David. He came like us. Again, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10 and 11. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. For it became Him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both He that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause He is not ashamed to call them brethren. You see, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. Why? Because he is our brother. He is one of us. He became man. You may think, well, how is it possible for God to become a man? Well, this is the mystery of godliness. God did become man. Why? Why did he become man? Why did he become like one of us? In verse 17, Hebrews 2 verse 17 says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In what? In all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He did it so He can be able to reconcile us with God. The only way that it was possible to draw us to Himself, the only way to be able to draw us to, the, to salvation, to draw us away from our path of destruction, is to, for Jesus to become man, for God, eternal deity, to become one of us, to be identified with humanity. Well, Jesus not only became man. What kind of a man did Jesus become? Let's look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He didn't just become a man, he became a servant. He became a lowest of men. Just think about this for a moment. I, I'm going to read a few things here and then I want you to think. Think of Christ's humiliation. He took upon himself fallen, suffering human nature, degraded and defiled by sin. He took our sorrows, bearing our grief and shame. 
He endured all the temptations wherewith man is beset. He united humanity with divinity. A divine spirit dwelt in a temple of flesh. That's right, Jesus did not cease to become God. This is why you read through the Bible that people worshipped Him even while He was on this earth. Why could they worship Him? Because He still was God. Let's take a look in Matthew chapter 1. When, Je when Jesus was about to be born, it makes it very clear that Jesus was still God. Matthew chapter 1. Okay, let's begin with verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Why? Because she was found with a child and he knew he didn't have anything to do with it. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus had a dual nature. He had divinity and he had humanity combined. That is what made him able to draw all men unto himself. If he was just a common man, he could draw no one. But it is his divinity that draws us unto him. In consideration of this, can men have one particle of exaltation? As we trace down the life and sufferings and humiliation of Christ, can we lift up our proud heads as if we were to bear no trials, no shame, no humiliation? I say to the followers of Christ, look to Calvary and blush for shame at your self-important ideas. All this humiliation of the majesty of heaven was for guilty condemned man. He went lower and lower in his humiliation until there were no lower depths that he could reach in order to lift man from the moral defilement. Jesus came down low enough to be able to reach his hand over and pull us out of our pit of destruction. But you may think to yourself, yeah, but Jesus wants everything. That's not fair. Jesus wants my whole life. He wants to change everything. I have to give up everything for Jesus. I have a question for you. What do you give up when you give all to Jesus? What are you giving to Him? All you have is a sin-polluted heart for Jesus to cleanse, for Jesus to purify by His own blood and to save us by His matchless love. And yet, we think it's too hard to give everything up. And what did Jesus give up for you? Jesus gave up what he was before. He gave up being there, adored by the angels, worshipped by the universe, to come down here to be spit upon and finally nailed to the cross. My friend, God does not require us to give up anything that is not for our best interest to retain. In all that God does, He has the well-being of His children in view. Oh, if all who have not chosen Christ might realize that Christ has something vastly better to offer us than we are seeking for ourselves. My dear friend, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And I want to close with this appeal, appeal that Jesus gave Himself in Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is asking you today, Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Are you tired of the life that you have been living? Are you tired of keep looking down the down river to see where the fall is, to see where you're going to be finally destroyed and run for safety? Forget it. Now is the time. Now is your day of opportunity. Right now is the time. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm.